Greetings. If you have been a faithful follower of this channel, then the following will tie in all that has been expressed within these videos. If you have not watched the prior videos, then you are encouraged to do so, as they will make this video make sense. The time has come, before the end of this cycle age, that the truth must be told. The ancient tree of peace, Islam, which means, peace, Islamism. In what is known as, Old Tartaria. Egypt, the capital empire of the Dominion of Africa. The inhabitants of Africa are the descendants of the ancient Canaanites from the land of Canaan. Old man Cush and his family are the first inhabitants of Africa who came from the land of Canaan. His father Ham and his family were second. Then came the word Ethiopia, which means the demarcation line of the dominion of Amixim, the first true and divine name of Africa. The dividing of the land between the father and the son. The dominion of Cush, northeast and southeast Africa and northwest and southwest was his father's dominion of Africa. In later years many of their brethren from Asia and the Holy Lands joined them. The Moabites from the land of Moab who received permission from the pharaohs of Egypt to settle and inhabit northwest Africa. They were the founders and are the true possessors of the present Moroccan Empire. With their Canaanite, Hittite, and Amorite brethren who sojourned from the land of Canaan seeking new homes. Their dominion and inhabitation extended from northeast and southwest Africa, across Great Atlantis even unto the present North, South, and Central America and also Mexico and the Atlantis Islands, before the Great Earthquake, which caused the Great Atlantic Ocean. The River Nile was dredged and made by the ancient pharaohs of Egypt, in order to trade with the surrounding kingdoms. Also the Niger River was dredged by the great pharaoh of Egypt in those ancient days for trade, and it extends eastward from the River Nile, westward across the Great Atlantic. It was used for trade and transportation. The divine origin of the Asiatic nations. The fallen sons and daughters of the Asiatic nation of North America need to learn to love instead of hate, and to know their higher self and lower self. This is the uniting of the Holy Koran of Mecca, for teaching and instructing all Moorish Americans, etc. The key of civilization was and is in the hands of the Asiatic nations. The Moorish, who were ancient Moabites, and the founders of the holy city of Mecca, the Egyptians who were the Hamathites, and of a direct descendant of Mizraim, the Arabians. The seed of Hagar, Japanese and Chinese. The Hindus of India, the descendants of the ancient Canaanites, Hittites, and Moabites of the land of Canaan. The Asiatic nations of North, South, and Central America. The Moorish Americans and Mexicans of North America. Brazilians, Argentinians and Chileans in South America. Colombians, Nicaraguans, and the natives of San Salvador in Central America, etc. All of these are Muslims. The Turks are the true descendants of Hagar, who are the chief protectors of the Islamic creed of Mecca. Beginning from Muhammad I, the founding of the Uniting of Islam, by the command of the great universal God Allah. Before the Roman Empire there was the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire was one of Muslim rule, ruled by Moors and the Roman Empire is one of Christian rule, ruled by Europeans. Let us start this piece here, with, the beginning of Christianity. The foundation of Christianity began in Rome. The Roman nations founded the first church, of whom crucified Jesus of Nazareth for seeking to redeem his people from under the Roman yoke and law. Jesus himself was of the true blood of the ancient Canaanites and Moabites and the inhabitants of Africa. Seeking to redeem his people in those days from the pressure of the pale-skinned nations of Europe, Rome crucified him according to their law. Then Europe had peace for a long time until Muhammad I came upon the scene and fulfilled the works of Jesus of Nazareth. The holy teaching of Jesus was to the common people, to redeem them from under the great pressure of the hands of the unjust. That the rulers and the rich would not oppress the poor. Also that the lion and the lamb may lay down together and neither would be harmed when morning came. These teachings were not accepted by the rulers, neither by the rich, because they loved the principles of the Ten Commandments. Through the Ten Commandments the rulers and the rich live, while the poor suffer and die. The lamb is the poor people, the lion is the rulers and the rich, and through love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice all men are one and equal to seek their own destiny and to worship under their own vine and fig tree. After the principles of the holy and divine laws of their forefathers, all nations of the earth in these modern days are seeking peace, 
but there is but one true and divine way that peace may be obtained in these days. And it is through love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice being taught universally to all nations, in all lands. The original constitution, the one which we were taught was burned up in a fire, is in the hands of the people who were the sovereign people and families of our government, who were chased down to be killed, and fled to Africa where they were given their own country called they named Liberia. Free. The people even today in this part of Africa, call themselves, Americans. The Moorish Empire ruled for 711 years of dominance. The Moors were looking to replicate New Egypt globally. They started to procreate with the Slavs, which were trafficked women bought by to them as concubines. They ended up having bastard children with them, which was forbidden in the Brotherhood. They believed the purity of the blood could maintain the reincarnation of the ascended masters. As this practice of blood mixing spread all over Europe, many of these barons had fractioned territorial leadership in houses just like Game of Thrones is shown. Many of them didn't bear any sons within their marriage so they used their bastard sons they had with the Slavs to pass down the leadership. As this practice became more popular, Many of these new barons' houses choose their mother's side instead, due to the harsh treatment of the Moors. It was practice such as this that gave birth to Vlad the Impaler, or Vlad Dracula. His goal was to rage war against his Moorish ancestors to be kicked out of Europe. He is once held captive by the Ottoman Empire. This is where he learned the secret about the blood, and after he became free, the Crusades war had begun, and he joined alliances against the Ottomans. Every kill within the war, he began to drink the enemy's blood because of what he learned. He believed he could harness the soul of these soldiers and bear of their secrets. As they show you in Dracula movies, the dead adversaries are always hung up on sticks as a ritualistic symbol of the crucifixion of the Christic blood. After the Crusades war was won, the church became the vector, the leader of the new world in the Dracula order. Vampirism was introduced in the secret walls of the church. As their new colonial era begins, the descendants of the Moors, consisting mostly of a mulatto class and Caucasians as the ruling class, they wanted to finish the job of their Moorish fathers for global domination to conquer the new world. They ventured out to the Old East, in modern day, the New West. Christopher Columbus, Extracts from Journal. This document is from the Journal of Columbus in his voyage of 1492. The meaning of this voyage is highly contested. On the one hand, it is witness to the tremendous vitality and verve of the late medieval and early modern Europe which was on the verge of acquiring a world hegemony. The Moorish Empire. On the other hand, the direct result of this and later voyages was the virtual extermination, by ill treatment and disease, of the vast majority of the native inhabitants, and the made-up story of the enormous growth of the transatlantic slave trade. It might not be fair to lay the blame at Columbus's feet, but since all sides treat him as a symbol, such questions cannot be avoided. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whereas, most Christian, high, excellent, and powerful princes, king and queen of Spain and of the islands of the sea, are sovereigns, this present year 1492. 
after your highness had terminated the war with the Moors reigning in Europe. The same having been brought to an end in the great city of Granada, where on the second day of January, this present year, I saw the royal banners of your highnesses planted by force of arms upon the towers of the Alhambra, which is the fortress of that city, and saw the Moorish king come out at the gate of the city and kiss the hands of your highnesses, and the prince my sovereign. And in the present month, in consequence of the information which I had given your highnesses respecting the countries of India and of a prince, called Great Khan, which in our language signifies King of Kings. How at many times he and his predecessors had sent to Rome soliciting instructors who might teach him on our holy faith, and his holy father had never granted his request. Whereby great numbers of people were lost, believing in idolatry and doctrines of perdition. Your Highness, as Catholic Christians, and princes who love and promote the holy Christian faith, and are enemies of the doctrine of Muhammad, and of all idolatry and heresy. Quran today, is the not the original Quran, is the not the original Quran, is the not the original Quran. It was put together by a group of Christian and Jewish scholars who later became known as Jesuits priests in 1534. They were of the Roman Catholic Church. They were a group of seven advisors to the popes, ever since Augustine developed a technique to convert Arabs to Catholicism. He was the pioneer of destruction by destroying the original Quran and killing men that memorized it. He also placed a false Muhammad named Musalamat ibn Habib. He came from Riyadh in Arabia with his god name Rahman. This new Quran was the main tool to bring the Arabs under Roman's rule. As a matter of fact, this Quran was first printed in Arabic with the Persian script. That means most Muslims haven't read the original, which was in possession of a Catholic priest named Warika ibn Nafal, who worked with the real and false Muhammad. You must overstand the Roman Catholic Church created this religion Al-Islam 1400 years ago. It was a combination of Babylonian, Jewish, Coptic, and Roman Catholicism. Warika ibn Nafal, who was the uncle of Muhammad's first wife Qadiyya, was a faithful Roman Catholic. Determined to send me, Christopher Columbus, to the above-mentioned countries of India. To see the said princes, people, and territories, and to learn their disposition and the proper method of converting them to our holy faith. End. I mean, there were castles and big, massive buildings in America before Columbus in 1492, and that whole story, before he even got here. So if there were already all these massive castles, massive buildings, and all these people, big people too, in, before 1492, then how did they have the technology while Christopher Columbus is coming over on his cute, you know, Santa Maria, or Pinta, or whatever it was, those the three ships that they used. And where are those ships? How come we don't see those ships? How come we don't see those today? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Wouldn't those be, like, put in a museum? What do you put the three most important ships of America in a museum? We don't see those either. And that's the thing, there's so many parts that are missing in which we don't see, but then we see all this nonsense over here. What about the Egyptian-like artifacts found in the Grand Canyon? Yes, same exact thing. So you have Egyptian artifacts in the Grand Canyon in Arizona. A Moorish American questionnaire asks, name some of the marks that were put upon the Moors of Northwest by the European nations in 1774? Negro, Black, Colored and Ethiopia. John Hansen, 1721-1783. When we think of the President of the United States, many people do not realize that we are actually referring to presidents elected under the U.S. Constitution. Everybody knows that the first president in that sense was George Washington. But in fact the Articles of Confederation, the predecessor to the Constitution, also called for a president. Eight men were appointed to serve one-year terms as president under the Articles of Confederation. The first was John Hansen, in 1781. His exact title was the President of the United States in Congress Assembled. The Articles of Confederation did not specifically define the powers of the president, and so under John Hansen's leadership various departments of the government were formed. He alone had the authority to correspond and negotiate with foreign governments. During his one year in office, he approved the Great Seal of the United States that is still used today and helped establish the first U.S. Treasury Department. 
He led the flight to guarantee the statehood of the Western territories beyond the Appalachian Mountains that had been controlled by some of the original 13 colonies. Upon his death on November 21, 1783, the following eulogy appeared in the Maryland Gazette. Thus was ended the career of one of America's greatest statesmen. While hitherto practically unknown to our people, and this is true as to nearly all the generations that have lived since his day, his great handiwork, the nation which he helped to establish, remains as a fitting tribute to his memory. It is doubtful if there has ever lived on this side of the Atlantic, a nobler character or shrewder statesman. One would search in vain to find a more powerful personage, or a more aggressive leader, in the annals of American history. And it is extremely doubtful if there has ever lived in an age since the advent of civilization, a man with a keener grasp of, or a deeper insight into, such democratic ideals as are essential to the promotion of personal liberty and the extension of human happiness. He was firm in his opinion that the people of America were capable of ruling themselves without the aid of a king. ConstitutionFacts.com From Yale Law School The Mecklenburg Resolutions, May 20, 1775 I resolved that whosoever directly or indirectly abets, or in any way, form, or manner countenances the unchartered and dangerous invasion of our rights, as claimed by Great Britain, is an enemy to this country to America and to the inherent and inalienable rights of man. 2. Resolved. That we do hereby declare ourselves a free and independent people. Our, and of right, ought to be a sovereign and self-governing association, under the control of no power, other than that of our God and the general government of the Congress to the maintenance of which independence we solemnly pledge to each other our mutual cooperation, our lives, our fortunes, and our most sacred honor. 3. Resolve. That as we acknowledge the existence and control of no law or legal officer, civil or military, within this county, we do hereby ordain and adopt as a rule of life, all, each, and every one of our former laws, wherein, nevertheless, the crown of Great Britain never can be considered as holding rights, privileges, or authorities therein. IV. Resolved. That all, each, and every military officer in this country is hereby reinstated in his former command and authority, he acting to their regulations, and that every member present of this delegation, shall henceforth be a civil officer. This. A justice of the peace, in the character of a committee man, to issue process, hear and determine all matters of controversy, according to said adopted laws, and to preserve peace, union, and harmony in said county, to use every exertion to spread the love of country and fire of freedom throughout America, until a more general and organized government be established in this province. Abraham Alexander, Chairman. John M. C. K. N. I. T. T. Alexander, Secretary. Source. The Federal and State Constitutions, Colonial Charters, and Other Organic Laws of the States, Territories, and Colonies now or heretofore forming the United States of America compiled and edited under the Act of Congress of June 30, 1906 by Francis Newton Thorpe, Washington, D.C. Government Printing Office, 1909. Note, because of the obvious, this is the heading now attached to this document in some places. Allegedly written on May 20, 1775. The Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence declared that the people of Mecklenburg County, North Carolina were free and independent people from Great Britain. In 1819, the Raleigh Register printed a supposed reproduction of the documented recited by a descendant of one of the signers because the original had been destroyed by fire 19 years prior. After years of debate, the document was eventually revealed as a fake. Journals of the Continental Congress Speech to the Six Nations, July 13, 1775. Thursday, July 13, 1775. The Congress met according to adjournment. The committee appointed to prepare a speech to the Indians reported the same. The speech to the Six Nations being read and debated by paragraphs was agreed to and is as follows. A speech to the Six Confederate Nations, Mohawks, Oneidas, Tuscaroras, Onondagas, Cayugas, Senecas, from the twelve united colonies, convened in council at Philadelphia. Brothers, sachems, and warriors. We, the delegates from the twelve united provinces, viz. New Hampshire, Massachusetts Bay, Rhode Island, 
Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, the three lower counties of New Castle, Kent, and Sussex, on Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina, now sitting in General Congress at Philadelphia, send us talk to you our brothers. We are 65 in number, chosen and appointed by the people throughout all these provinces and colonies, to meet and sit together in one great council, to consult together for the common good of the land, and speak and act for them. Brothers, in our consultation we have judged it proper and necessary to send you this talk, as we are upon the same island, that you may be informed of the reasons of this great council, the situation of our civil constitution, and our disposition towards you our Indian brothers of the Six Nations and their allies. Three strings, or a small belt. Brothers and friends, now attend. When our fathers crossed the great water and came over to this land, the King of England gave them a talk, assuring them that they and their children should be his children, and that if they would leave their native country and make settlements, and live here, and buy, and sell, and trade with their brethren beyond the water, they should still keep hold of the same covenant chain and enjoy peace. And it was covenanted, that the fields, houses, goods and possessions which our fathers should acquire, should remain to them as their own, and be their children's forever, and at their sole disposal. Trusting that this covenant should never be broken, our fathers came a great distance beyond the great water, laid out their money here, built houses, cleared fields, raised crops, and through their own labor and industry grew tall and strong. They have bought, sold and traded with England according to agreement, sending to them such things as they wanted, and taking in exchange such things as were wanted here. The King of England and his people kept the way open for more than 100 years, and by our trade became richer, and by a union with us, greater and stronger than the other kings and people who lived beyond the water. All this time they lived in great friendship with us, and we with them, for we are brothers one blood. Whenever they were struck, we instantly felt as though the blow had been given to us their enemies were our enemies. Whenever they went to war, we sent our men to stand by their side and fight for them, and our money to help them and make them strong. They thanked us for our love, and sent us good talks, and renewed their promise to be one people forever. Brothers and friends, open a kind ear. We will now tell you of the quarrel betwixt the counselors of King George and the inhabitants and colonies of America. Many of his counselors are proud and wicked men. They persuade the king to break the covenant chain, and not to send us any more good talks. A considerable number have prevailed upon him to enter into a new covenant against us, and have torn asunder and cast behind their backs the good old covenant which their ancestors and ours entered into, and took strong hold of. They now tell us they will slip their hand into our pocket without asking, as though it were their own, and at their pleasure they will take from us our charters or written civil constitution, which we love as our lives also our plantations, our houses and goods whenever they please, without asking our leave. That our vessels may go to this island in the sea, but to this or that particular island we shall not trade any more. And in case of our non-compliance with these new orders, they shut up our harbors. Brothers, this is our present situation thus have many of the king's counselors and servants dealt with us. If we submit or comply with their demands, you can easily perceive to what state we will be reduced. If our people labor on the field, they will not know who shall enjoy the crop. If they hunt in the woods, it will be uncertain who shall taste of the meat or have the skins. If they build houses, they will not know whether they may sit round the fire, with their wives and children. They cannot be sure whether they shall be permitted to eat, drink, and wear the fruits of their own labor and industry. Brothers and friends of the Six Nations, attend. We upon this island have often spoken entreated the king and his servants the counselors, that peace and harmony might still continue between us that we cannot part with or lose our hold of the old covenant chain which united our fathers and theirs. That we want to brighten this chain and keep the way open as our fathers did. That we want to live with them as brothers, labor, trade, travel abroad, eat and drink in peace. We have often asked them to love us and live in such friendship with us as their fathers did with ours. We told them again that we judged we were exceedingly injured that they might as well kill us, as take away our property and the necessaries of life. We have asked why they treat us thus? What has become of our repeated addresses and supplications to them? Who bath shut the ears of the king to the cries of his children in America? 
No soft answer, no pleasant voice from beyond the water has yet sounded in our ears. Brothers, thus stands the matter betwixt Old England and America. You Indians know how things are proportioned in a family between the father and the son, the child carries a little pack England we regard as the father this island may be compared to the son. The father has a numerous family both at home and upon this island. He appoints a great number of servants to assist him in the government of his family. In process of time, some of his servants grow proud and ill-natured they were displeased to see the boy so alert and walk so nimbly with his pack. They tell the father, and advise him to enlarge the child's pack they prevail the pack is increased the child takes it up again as he thought it might be the father's pleasure speaks but few words those very small for he was loath to offend the father. Those proud and wicked servants finding they had prevailed, laughed to see the boy sweat and stagger under his increased load. By and by, they apply to the father to double the boy's pack, because they heard him complain and without any reason said that he is a cross child correct him if he complains any more. The boy entreats the father addresses the great servants in a decent manner, that the pack might be lightened he could not go any farther humbly asks. If the old fathers, in any of their records, had described such a pack for the child after all the tears and entreaties of the child, the pack was redoubled the child stands a little, while staggering under the weight ready to fall every moment. However he entreats the father once more, though so faint he could only lisp out his last humble supplication waits a while no voice returns. The child concludes the father could not hear those proud servants had intercepted his supplications, or stopped the ears of the father. He therefore gives one struggle and throws off the pack, and says he cannot take it up again such a weight would crush him down and kill him and he can but die if he refuses. Upon this, those servants are very wrath and tell the father many false stories respecting the child they bring a great cudgel to the father, asking him to take it in his hand and strike the child. This may serve to illustrate the present condition of the king's American subjects or children. Amidst these oppressions we now and then hear a mollifying and reviving voice from some of the king's wise counselors, who are our friends and feel for our distresses. When they heard our complaints and our cries, they applied to the king, also told those wicked servants, that this child in America was not a cross boy, it had sufficient reason for crying, and if the cause of its complaint was neglected, it would soon assume the voice of a man, plead for justice like a man, and defend its rights and support the old covenant chain of the fathers. Brothers, listen. Notwithstanding all our entreaties, we have but little hope the king will send us any more good talks, by reason of his evil counselors. They have persuaded him to send an army of soldiers and many ships of war, to rob and destroy us. They have shut up many of our harbors, seized and taken into possession many of our vessels. The soldiers have struck the blow, killed some of our people. The blood now runs of the American children. They have also burned our houses and towns, and taken much of our goods. Brothers, we are now necessitated to rise, and forced to fight, or give up our civil constitution, run away and leave our farms and houses behind us. This must not be. Since the king's wicked counselors will not open their ears, and consider our just complaints, and the cause of our weeping, and bath given the blow, we are determined, to drive away the king's soldiers, and to kill and destroy all those wicked men we find in arms against the peace of the twelve united colonies upon this island. We think our cause is just, therefore hope God will be on our side. We do not take up the hatchet and struggle for honor and conquest, but to maintain our civil constitution and religious privileges, the very same for which our forefathers left their native land and came to this country. Brothers and friends, we desire you will hear and receive what we have now told you, and that you will open a good ear and listen to what we are now going to say. This is a family quarrel between us and Old England. You Indians are not concerned in it. We don't wish you to take up the hatchet against the king's troops. We desire you to remain at home, and not join on either side, but keep the hatchet buried deep. In the name and in behalf of all our people, we ask and desire you to love peace and maintain it, and to love and sympathize with us in our troubles, that the path may be kept open with all our people and yours, to pass and repass, without molestation. Brothers, we live upon the same ground with you. The same island is our common birthplace. We desire to sit down under the same tree of peace with you. Let us water its roots and cherish its growth, 
till the large leaves and flourishing branches shall extend to the setting sun, and reach the skies. Brothers, observe well. What is it we have asked of you? Nothing but peace, notwithstanding our present disturbed situation and if application should be made to you by any of the king's unwise and wicked ministers to join on their side, we only advise you to deliberate, with great caution, and in your wisdom look forward to the consequences of a compliance. For, if the king's troops take away our property, and destroy us who are of the same blood with themselves, what can you, who are Indians, expect from them afterwards? Therefore, we say, brothers, take care hold fast to your covenant chain. You now know our disposition towards you, the six nations of Indians, and your allies. Let this our good talk remain at Onondaga, your central council house. We depend upon you to send and acquaint your allies to the northward, the seven tribes on the River Street Lawrence, that you have this talk of ours at the great council fire of the six nations. And when they return, we invite your great men to come and converse farther with us at Albany, where we intend to rekindle the council fire, which you and our ancestors sat round in great friendship. Brothers and friends, we greet you all farewell. The large belt of intelligence and declaration. Brothers, we have said we wish you Indians may continue in peace with one another, and with us the white people. Let us both be cautious in our behavior towards each other at this critical state of affairs. This island now trembles, the wind whistles from almost every quarter let us fortify our minds and shut our ears against false rumors let us be cautious what we receive for truth, unless spoken by wise and good men. If anything disagreeable should ever fall out between us, the twelve united colonies, and you, the six nations, to wound our peace, let us immediately seek measures for healing the breach. From the present situation of our affairs, we judge it wise and expedient to kindle up a small council fire at Albany, where we may hear each other's voice, and disclose our minds more fully to each other. A small belt. Ordered, that a similar talk be prepared for the other Indian nations, preserving the tenor of the above, and altering it so as to suit the Indians in the several departments. Source. Journals of the Continental Congress 1774. 1779, Volume 2, pages 177,183. Edited from the original records in the Library of Congress by Worthington Chauncey Ford. Chief, Division of Manuscripts. Washington, D.C., Government Printing Office, 1905. This is, this is what I wanted to show you because it, it is considered by many to be the most famous tree in all of Texas. Okay. This is the famous hanging tree of uh, Goliad County. It was a site of extrajudicial executions. In other words, this is where they lynched Mexicans. How many Mexicans were there? Well, some say 80, 90, 100, but we really don't even know. And of course, if you, on the other side of there is a famous whipping post where they would tie Mexicans and, and other people, blacks, and, and, and whip them for uh, transgressions against the, the, uh, the social order. Uh, over there, uh, we have a tree where it is said that they hung the blacks because, um, I don't know, it's kind of crazy. Even, you know, in Texas, we had standards. You can't lynch a, a black person from the same tree that you lynch a brown person. And, you know, it just ain't fitting. It ain't fitting. It just ain't fitting. So, right. so yeah, so they, I mean, uh, this, this is the kind of crazy racism that fueled all this. And why? It was economics. And it was also the fact that they wanted our land. They, in fact, they came here to take our land and they were very successful. It's a tourist thing now here. Everything's named hanging tree around here. But um, I mean, when you really think about it, it, it should give you the creeps. Back then, of course, a hanging was a big community event. Little boys would climb into the, to the adjacent trees to get a good view. Uh, people would bring picnic baskets. They would make a day out of it. It was like a big jovi jovial affair. Of course, this is for the white people. The black people and Mexicans were, weren't going to come to this because, it, you know, they, they were... The, the object of it was, was to, was to uh, instill terror in their lives. Um, this is... Uh, I mean, this is horrible. You know? Yeah, it is horrible. It is what it is. It is what it is. 
the events that took place here in Goliad weren't unique. Over the next 70 years, there were 871 documented lynchings of Mexican Americans in 13 Western states. And yet the violence found in the rest of the Southwest didn't compare to the horror of South Texas. In a single decade, from 1910 to 1920, historians estimate as many as 5,000 Mexican Americans were murdered in a brutal wave of terror and mass executions. In proportion to their numbers, Mexicans were lynched in the West as often as Blacks were lynched in the South. The words spoken by John Hansen, the first Moorish president, on July 4, 1776. They may stretch our necks on all the gibbets in the land. They may turn every rock into a scaffold, every tree into a gallows, every home into a grave. And yet the words of that parchment can never die. They may pour our blood on a thousand scaffolds, and yet from every drop that dies the axe a new champion of freedom will spring into birth. The British king may blot out the stars of God from the sky, but he cannot blot out his words written on that parchment there. The works of God may perish, his words never. The words of this declaration will live in the world long after our homes are dust. To the mechanic in his workshop they will speak hope, to the slave in the mind's freedom. But to the coward kings, these words speak in tones of warning they cannot choose but he. Sign that parchment. Sign. If the next moment the gibbet's rape is about your neck. Sign. If the next minute this hall rings with the clash of falling axes. Sign. By all your hopes in life or death, as men, as husbands, as fathers, brothers, sign your names to the parchment, or be accursed forever. Sign. And not only for yourselves, but for all ages, for that parchment will be the textbook of freedom, the Bible of the rights of man forever. Nay. Do not start and whisper with surprise. It is truth, your own hearts witness it. God proclaims it. Look at this strange band of exiles and outcasts, suddenly transformed into a people. A handful of men, weak in arms, but mighty in God-like faith. Nay, look at your recent achievements, your Bunker Hill, your Lexington, and then tell me, if you can, that God has not given America to be free. It is not given to our poor human intellect to climb to the skies, and to pierce the counsel of the Almighty One. But methinks I stand among the awful clouds which veil the brightness of God's throne. Methinks I see the recording angel come trembling up to that throne and speak his dread message. Father, the old world is baptized in blood. Father, look with one glance of thine eternal eye, and behold evermore that terrible sight, man trodden beneath the oppressor's feet. Nations lost in blood, murder, and superstition, walking hand in hand over the graves of the victims, and not a single voice of hope to man. He stands there, the angel, trembling with the record of human guilt. But hark! The voice of God speaks from out of the awful cloud. Let there be light again. Tell my people, the poor and oppressed, to go out from the old world, from oppression and blood, and build my altar in the new. As I live, my friends, I believe that to be his voice. Yes, were my soul trembling on the verge of eternity, were this hand freezing in death, were this voice choking in the last struggle, I would still, with the last impulse of that soul, with the last wave of that hand, with that last gasp of that voice, implore you to remember this truth. God has given America to be free. Yes, as I sank into the gloomy shadows of the grave, with my last faint whisper I would beg you to sign that parchment for the sake of those millions whose very breath is now hushed in intense expectation as they look up to you for the awful words, you are free. Note, America, Amixum, at one time was part of Africa, Amixum. The Moors walked over here before the Great Continental Drift. They were also known by various other names such as Olmecs, the Leni Lenape, which means, the original people, also known as the Nanticoke Moors, etc. Articles of Agreement and Confederation, made and entered into by Andrew and Thomas Lewis, Esquires, Commissioners for, and in behalf of the United States of North America of the one part, and Captain White Eyes, Captain John Kilbuck, 
Jr., and Captain Pine, the uptise and chief men of the Delaware Nation of the other part. Article 1. That all offenses or acts of hostilities by one or either of the contracting parties against the other be mutually forgiven and buried in the depth of oblivion, never more to be had in remembrance. Article 2. That a perpetual peace and friendship shall from henceforth take place and subsist between the contracting parties aforesaid through all succeeding generations. And if either of the parties are engaged in a just and necessary war with any other nation or nations, that then each shall assist the other in due proportion to their abilities, till their enemies are brought to reasonable terms of accommodation. And that if either of them shall discover any hostile design forming against the other, they shall give the earliest notice thereof that timest measures may be taken to prevent their ill effect. Article 3. And whereas the United States are engaged in a just and necessary war, in defense and support of life, liberty and independence, against the King of England and his adherents. And as said King is yet possessed of several posts and forts on the lakes and other places, the reduction of which is of great importance to the peace and security of the contracting parties, and as the most practicable way for the troops of the United States to some of the posts and forts is by passing through the country of the Delaware nation. The aforesaid deputies, on behalf of themselves and their nation, do hereby stipulate and agree to give a free passage through their country to the troops aforesaid, and the same to conduct by the nearest and best ways to the posts, forts or towns of the enemies of the United States, affording to said troops, on the commanding officers and sea, paying, or engaging to pay, the full value of whatever they can supply them with. And the said deputies, on the behalf of their nation, engage to join the troops of the United States aforesaid, with such a number of their best and most expert warriors as they can spare, consistent with their own safety, and act in concert with them, and for the better security of the old men, women and children of the aforesaid nation, whilst their warriors are engaged against the common enemy. It is agreed on the part of the United States, that a fort of sufficient strength and capacity be built at the expense of the said states, with such assistance as it may be in the power of the said Delaware nation to give, in the most convenient place, and advantageous situation, as shall be agreed on by the commanding officer of the troops aforesaid. With the advice and concurrence of the deputies of the aforesaid Delaware nation, which fort shall be garrisoned by such a number of the troops of the United States, as the commanding officer can spare for the present, and hereafter by such numbers, as the wise men of the United States in council, shall think most conducive to the common good. Article 4. For the better security of the peace and friendship now entered into by the contracting parties, against all infractions of the same by the citizens of either party, to the prejudice of the other, neither party shall proceed to the infliction of punishments on the citizens of the other, otherwise than by securing the offender or offenders by imprisonment or any other competent means, till a fair and impartial trial can be had by judges or juries of both parties, as near as can be to the laws, customs and usages of the contracting parties and natural justice. The mode of such trials to be hereafter fixed by the wise men of the United States in Congress assembled, with the assistance of such deputies of the Delaware nation, as may be appointed to act in concert with the in adjusting this matter to their mutual liking. And it is further agreed between the parties aforesaid, that neither shall entertain or give countenance to the enemies of the other, or protect in their respective states, criminal fugitives, servants or slaves, but the same to apprehend, and secure and deliver to the state or states, to which such enemies, criminals, servants or slaves respectively belong. Article verses whereas the confederation entered into by the Delaware nation and the United States, renders the first dependent on the latter for all the articles of clothing, utensils and implements of war, and it is judged not only reasonable, but indispensably necessary that the aforesaid nation be supplied with such articles from time to time, as far as the United States may have it in their power, by a well-regulated trade, under the conduct of an intelligent, candid agent, with an adequate salary, one more influenced by the love of his country, and a constant attention to the duties of his department by promoting the common interest, than the sinister purpose of converting and binding all the duties of his office to his private emolument. Convinced of the necessity of such measures, the commissioners of the United States, at the earnest solicitation of the deputies aforesaid, have engaged in behalf of the United States, 
that such a trade shall be afforded said nation conducted on such principles and mutual interest as the wisdom of the United States and Congress assembled shall think most conductive to adopt for their mutual convenience. Article 6. Whereas the enemies of the United States have endeavored, by every artifice in their power, to possess the Indians in general with an opinion, that it is the design of the state aforesaid, to extirpate the Indians and take possession of their country to obviate such false suggestion. The United States do engage to guarantee to the aforesaid nation of Delawares, and their heirs, all their territorial rights in the fullest and most ample manner, as it both been founded by former treaties, as long as they the said Delaware nation shall abide by, and hold fast the chain of friendship now entered into. And it is further agreed on between the contracting parties should it for the future be found conductive for the mutual interest of both parties to invite any other tribes who have been friends to the interest of the United States, to join the present confederation, and to form a state whereof the Delaware nation shall be the head, and have a representation in Congress. Provided, nothing contained in this article to be considered as conclusive until it meets with the approbation of Congress. And it is also the intent and meaning of this article, that no protection or countenance shall be afforded to any who are at present our enemies, by which they might escape the punishment they deserve. In witness whereof, the parties have hereunto interchangeably set their hands and seals, as Fort Pitt, September 17, Anno Domini 1778, Andrew Lewis, L.S., Thomas Lewis, L.S., White Eyes, his X mark, L.S., The Pipe, his X mark, L.S., John Kilbuck, his X mark, L.S., in the presence of Latch and McIntosh, Brigadier General, Commander the Western Department, Daniel Broadhead, Colonel 8th Pennsylvania Regiment, W. Crawford, Colonel. John Campbell, John Stevenson, John Gibson, Colonel 13th Virginia Regiment, A. Graham, Brigade Major, Benjamin Mills, Joseph L. Finley, Captain 8th Pennsylvania Regiment, John Finley, Captain 8th Pennsylvania Regiment. Signed, September 17, 1778. The time has come that every nation must worship under its own vine and fig tree, and every tongue must confess his own. Through sin and disobedience, every nation has suffered slavery due to the fact that they honored not the creed and principles of their forefathers. That is why the nationality of the Moors was taken away from them in 1774 and the word Negro, black and colored, was given to the Asiatics of America who were of Moorish descent. Because they honored not the principles of their mother and father, and strayed after the gods of Europe of whom they knew nothing. Prophet Noble Drew Alley taught the Moorish Americans, that the Free National Constitution was ratified in 1774. Noble Drew Alley stated that, the Free National Constitutional Law that was enforced since 1774 declared all men equal and free and that constitution has never been changed. We never intended them to be anything other than a slave. But they began to grow in number and in power, and eventually they fought their way to some freedom. So we became even more cruel, and to keep our black Americans down, we lynched. But yet they rose. So then we used the welfare system, the criminal justice system, to, to keep them down, to contain them, to destroy them, but yet they rose and they're rising. Then we built prisons and jails to hold them. Yet, they rose. And so now, we are doing exactly what the Pharaoh did at the end. Sending out a decree. Kill him. So until we admit that when we wrote this constitution that all men are created equal, that we never intended to include our black brothers and sisters, our nation may end up facing exactly what the Egyptians faced when they refused to let God's people go. So I'm going to say this to my white fellow Americans, that the bloodshed that is on its way is not on the hands of our fellow black Americans, but is on our hands. We are the ones that are refusing to let God's people go. We are the ones that are refusing to acknowledge that we do not value our black brothers and sisters as equal individuals 
or equal Americans as us white men. And to my black brothers and sisters, the racial issues, as I've said, have been there from the very foundation. But why do we see it more? Because there's a shifting. See, us white men have been at the head since the foundation. But we've had a black president. And you know, we've done everything in our power to keep him from really changing things. Now we have another minority rising to the top, a white female. What does that say? Those of us who are white men who have been at the head are now starting to see and fear that we are going to become the tail. And we know what we've done to you. And so now we're fearful that you're going to do to us what we have done to you. But I will say this. I've lived in a black community for 23 years. I've never been treated the way that this country has treated my black Americans. So I call out my white Americans to say we better heed, repent, acknowledge, and change. People ask me all the time, they said, Dixon, man, why are all these poor redneck motherfuckers voting for Trump? They poor and they know that Trump is anti-labor, he's anti-union, anti-worker, pro-corporation. <laughs> Trump's passed multiple, multiple legislations and appointed so many anti-labor, anti-union judges and lawmakers and passed so many things to support big pharma, big corporations, billionaires. He has worked tirelessly to hurt poor people. The poor redneck motherfuckers busting their ass on bullshit pay every single fucking day in America. The coal miners, the truck drivers, whoever the fuck it may be, doing the hard labor. All you white motherfuckers out there doing that and voting for Trump. And I told my friend today why. MAGA is just a symbolism, a slogan for colonialization. Make America great again. Back to a time when we were great white colonizers. Trump is the great white colonizer hope. Colonizing, even though it sounds like a funny term, colonizing is what America is, honestly. It's what we did, it's what we've always done, it's what we are, it's our spirit, it's our culture. If you look at how we went around the world as colonizers out of Europe, colonized the whole entire planet and every continent. We enslaved. We genocided the, the natives and the indigenous people. We broke every treaty we ever had with indigenous people just so that we can maintain power and privilege for white folks. And that's what colonizing is. And Trump is the greatest colonizer we've had in many centuries. And that's why so many white folks, either consciously or unconsciously, are supporting Trump. Because Trump wants to give them power. He wants to give them Christian power. Christian nationalism is all about political power. It's about forcing Christianity back into the government and into our laws and creating a theocracy. And there's a plan to do that. Trump's part of that plan to create a real genuine theocracy and do away with democracy where that Christianity will be forced upon you like a, a fascist dictatorship, but a Christian fascist dictatorship. And really, that's what a lot of white Christians want. They never really cared about Christianity has never really been about Jesus. It's been about using Jesus to steal shit. Trump's the biggest fucking criminal we've seen in the presidency. He's all about stealing shit. He stole from every fucking body ever worked for him. He stole from the American public. He's bamboozled us. He's lied to us. He got people killed during the pandemic. He is a bona fide narcissist criminal, a psychopath. And so is colonization. Colonization is just simple, social, psychological, systemic narcissism. And that's who Trump is. So, of course, white people, Christian white people, because colonization is based on two things, right? Based on Christianity, Christian power, and white power, white nationalism, white supremacy. Those two things we know Trump is going to, he's a bona fide racist. Everybody knows that. He's anti-black, anti-brown. He wants to stop black and brown folks, stop Muslims. So, I mean, he is the ultimate colonizer. And that is what many white people are about. That is our culture. That is our spirit here in America. And much around the world as white folks. We are colonizers, people. That's what we do best. Power, privilege. That's who we are. 
And that's why these poor, ignorant, redneck motherfuckers, the Christians of the world, the humble working class people of the world, and of course the rich, support Trump. Make America great again. Make America a bunch of inhumane colonizers again. So here's my final thought. For all you motherfuckers voting for the devil, for the Diablo himself, for voting for the Antichrist, Trump, here's my final point. At what cost are you voting for this monster, this con man, this criminal, this malignant narcissist psychopath? At what cost? You fuck yourself in the ass. You're anti-justice, anti-social justice, anti-economic justice, anti-racial justice. You're against your brothers and sisters because they're not white because they're not straight and because you're not Christian. You're against poor folks. You're against basic humanity. You're against everything that is right, fair, and just. You're against democracy. You're for theocracy. You're for white supremacy. These are the things that you are for when you vote for Trump. These are facts. This is his agenda, and you know goddamn well. And the only thing that's making you vote for him is your personal greed. That personal thing that wants you to fight for white power. That wants you to fight for white nationalism. Christian white nationalism. That's greed, folks. A vote for Trump is a vote for unadulterated greed. You are a colonizer, and you're voting for legit colonizer, not only colonizer, an anti-American colonizer. You want to integrate church and state. You don't believe in the principles that our founding fathers built our nation on, the separation of church and state. Nope. You want them to work together. You're a sick, twisted individual. No humanity and no concern for our country. Don't ever call yourself a patriot if you vote for that piece of shit. It is because the Christian faith, although they preach it, they themselves do not believe in perdition. That is to say, the loss of soul, eternal damnation, hell, utter ruin. It is for this reason that the Christian church adopted this belief and made it a part of their holy book, while at the same time they give no truth to it, but it is rather a device to control people and create the hell on earth experience that they derive economic security from. All native peoples not only believed, but now, knew that there are consequences for one's actions, and dependent on the energy you put out, determines the energy which returns, and when in receipt of that can fell like hell if the return not be a pleasant one. To this end, you live in a construct ruled by the will of the opposing forces of love, truth, peace, freedom and justice. And if ones do not wake up to the reality of their condition, no matter one's color of skin, you may find oneself an eternal slave to the darkness of Mont's thoughts, harnessed by the technology of biggest bank depository on earth, the bank of one's memory, or the memory bank, whose deposits are known as stacks. Yes, your memory can be removed and implanted into other avatars hence, you live forever, as a memory, and not as a soul. This is what is meant by the term, soulless. This is the Christian way and it has always been the Christian way, to rule mankind by force, military prowess and other psychological means. You chose to be here at this time and you chose to be here for a purpose. It is you who has to learn or acknowledge that purpose and live it. Most of you came here in this time to tilt the scales of justice to peace and tranquility and those who oppose you are really very small in number thou great in force. Yet. You are the nomad soul, and you are victorious when guided by the love in your heart. You can win. Be optimistic.